There's one more standard collection that we ought to meet, and it's a little bit different than the others. The reasons we would choose this standard collection are not so much because we want one operation to be faster than others, but because we want to work with data in a certain way. Now, to be clear, the collection we're going to work with, which is called a map, is similar in a lot of ways. We could think of it sort of as an extension of a set. So it provides us many of the same conveniences of a set, the ability to search quickly. The difference is what we are searching for. So typically, as we've seen, if I have a set full of values uh, and I go searching the set, all I'm asking is a yes or no question. I'm asking, is this thing that I already know, if I'm asking about it, is this thing in the set? So in previous examples, you know, we might have pear and raspberry in our set of strings. And if I search the set, I'd be asking the question, is the word raspberry in the set? Yes or no? The issue is often when I work with data, the reason I want to search isn't because I just want to know yes or no, does this thing exist? I want to search based on one criteria and then work with data that isn't entirely what I'm searching for. So uh, what I have up here is I think a typical example of one of the reasons I might use a map. So I've got uh, a bunch of exam grades corresponding to various students in the course. And um, if you're for some reason not already familiar with UVic student numbers, a UVic student number is the letter V followed by a bunch Bunch of digits, which we would have to treat as a string because we don't know whether that's going to become a W or something in the future. Uh, so what I might do is I might store a list of the student number of everybody in the class as well as what grade they got on the exam. The reason I do that, I have these pairs of data. I've got the student ID, uh, so information describing a particular student, and then a grade. If I keep a set of data like that and I want to search it, usually I'm not searching on criteria like, hey, is it true that V0012345-6 got 63? Well, no. Usually if I would search such a thing, I'd be saying, give me the grade associated with this student or something similar to that. In other words, I want to store a collection of data. The data can be broken into pairs. The pair, uh, each pair consists of some identifying piece of information, which I'm going to in this video call a key and then some other piece of information associated with it, which I'm going to call a value. And the reason I might store this and might want to search it is I might want to ask questions, I guess generically, along the lines of, here is a key, give me the associated value. So I'm not doing searching the way I would do it in a set. I'm instead doing a sort of associative search. I know part of what I'm looking for, so I, I know about one half of my data, I want the other half. And that's what a map provides us. It is what is called, in a general sense, so a, in the sense you might use the term in any language, an associative array. It provides us the ability of associating pairs of data in a similar fashion to how when you work with arrays in C, you associate an, a, a piece of data with each index of the array. The difference is a map is sort of like a, gener a generic magical array where you can use anything you want as the indexing criteria. In a sense, I could index my array by these student IDs or by names or by some other value instead of just being by consecutive natural numbers, the numerical indices of a traditional array. Uh, okay, so what we can think of the map as actually containing, though, in terms of being a standard collection, the map contains a bunch of pairs. Each pair contains a key and a value. The difference between maps and sets, though, is that when I go searching, I'm only searching based on the keys. So I use the keys as the indexing criteria instead of the entire thing, instead of the entire pair. Uh, and therefore, we sort of think of the value as riding along with the key in the map. Um, and like a set, the map does not permit duplicates, although there is such thing as a multi-map, which does. Uh, and the duplication criteria applies only to the key. So as far as how the map stays organized, its organization is based entirely on keys. So inside of a map, there can be multiple copies of the same value, but there cannot be multiple pairs with the same key. Um, and there's also, uh, in addition to STD map, which we'll notice has a lot of similarities to STD set, there's also STD unordered map, which provides the same distinctions as we have between set and unordered set. So I have here the um, uh, declarations of two maps. I've got student names, which is a map whose keys are going to be student uh, IDs, so V00 whatever, and whose values are going to be the name of the student. And I have down here a map called exam grades, which will duplicate sort of what I have over on the right, which would be I map the student ID, which is a string, to an int, which is the exam grade. I suppose I could have used unsigned int for that because I've, I've got some amount of mercy in the world. I don't give people negative exam grades. Although, well, who knows what will happen by the time you're watching this. Um, okay, so I want to fill these maps up with these key value pairs, keeping in mind that the map is designed for all the searching to be based on the keys. The value is just something that rides along with the key in the map. 
So how do I do that? It turns out there actually are a few ways of adding your pairs to the map. And I'm going to show off a few at the end of this video. Um, for the time being, I'm going to show off, I think, the most provocative one and probably one that most people end up using a lot, which is I'm using square brackets. I'm actually trying to make my map student names look a lot like an array, an array that I'm indexing by this string. So I'm indexing arrays by something other than numbers. That's where we get that term associative array. I'm associating the value of this student's name with their student ID. And then I can look them up by their student ID. Um, and then down here in exam grades, I'm doing something similar. So I, I use as the key a student ID, which is a string. And as a value, I use an int. Notice that in this map, I do have two different keys that are associated with the same value. That's fine. But I cannot have um, two different values associated with the same key. So each key is considered to be unique inside of the map, inside of a regular STD map object. So the square bracket operator is used to add keys to a, add, add these key value pairs uh, to a map or to modify the value associated with a particular key in the same way that you would use square brackets on an array in C to uh, examine or, or reassign the value at that index. And we can informally think of the keys as being like the indices of the map. All right, so I have a few tasks I want to perform. I guess I'll clear the screen. I have a few tasks that I want to perform to show off how I would use a map once I filled it up with this data. So these two maps each contain uh, four of these key value pairs. Now, this example won't worry about it, but it, the next video will talk a little bit about this. Um, when I'm working with these two maps that are sort of in parallel, both of them work with student IDs, maybe there is a question of, hey, what happens if a student is in one map but not the other? We'll talk about how you decide if an element is contained in the map in a different video. For now, I just want to talk about now that I have a map, full of stuff, how do I use it? What are some basic use cases? Um, okay, so one of them is I might want to print out the data that's actually associated with a particular um, student in the map. So I want to print out, here's a student ID, I want to print out their name and their grades, um, so their, their exam grade. Um, I'm going to do that with a print statement that's going to take a few lines for the sake of keeping it relatively clean looking. So um, the student with ID V00654322 uh, is named, and then on the next line I'll print out their name. So if I want to access the value associated with a particular key in my map, like this key here, I can also use the square bracket operator. So I do exam grades, and then I, I provide the string, provide the key. Uh, okay, and then I would say, and received a mark of, and then I'll print out their exam mark. And so I print out, actually, wait a minute. I should first print out their name. This is their name, student names. Um, and then on the next line, I print out exam grades of the same key. Uh, on the exam. And then I will print a new line. There we go. And we'll try that out. All right, so if we go take a look at the definitions of our keys and values, so the student with that ID, 654322, this is their name, and you can see I was able to pull that out of the map with ease, and their mark at the moment is this. Okay, so I'm able to use square brackets to actually examine, to, to retrieve the value associated with a particular key. Um, now, you might have, I mean, we've spent a lot of time on this course, I guess I, I keep discouraging people from using square brackets on vectors. Early in the course and in an earlier video, I said, if you're indexing a vector, you Use dot at. Do not use square brackets. Square brackets are nothing but trouble. Um, on a map, that is not the case. Square brackets and dot at have different behavior on a map, but both are valid. Both are healthy things to use on a map. Just be mindful of the difference. In this context, to retrieve the value associated with a key that we know does exist, I could use either. So I could write exam grades dot at instead of exam grades with square brackets to retrieve that value. And so we'll try that out. Uh, and the, the posted notes talk more about the distinction. Um, in general, if you're modifying something or you're using something that you know is already in the map, dot at is probably a better choice. But square brackets are also fine. The next video will point out one particular quirk associated with square brackets that uh, you might need to watch out for. Okay, so uh, here I'm printing out, I'm able to go into the map, uh, retrieve based on the key, the student's uh, name and their exam grade. Um, and then I want to talk about how we can modify those values once they're in the map. Um, okay, so I'm going to actually copy and paste the code from task one. So task two involves modifying this student's grade to be 89. And then I'm going to, it's going to say repeat task one. So I'm going to paste that in. Uh, okay, so I'm going to modify their grade. So I have a couple of ways of doing this. I could uh, say exam grades at the index uh, v0065432 equals um, the new grade, so 89. 
could do that. Uh, so I could just assign in this array style notation a new value to the key. Remember that if the key is not already in the map, so like I was doing up here, if the key is not already in the map, this assignment statement creates a new pair in the map, a new key value pair with this key, uh, whoops, this key and this value. If the key is already in the map, then it just updates it. It just updates the value associated with that key. That's it. So we never end up adding the key twice because we can't because the map doesn't support duplicates. So we'll start by trying this. Uh, and again, I am allowed, if I want to, instead of using square brackets, to use dot at. And uh, as we recall from, from a vector, uh, the dot at function is designed to only allow you to use valid indices. So on a vector, if I try and use an invalid index, something I would never actually legitimately need to do on a vector, dot at throws an exception, which is great because we don't want to use invalid indices. We want somebody to catch our mistake. On a map, the same thing is true. On a map, if I, if I use dot at to access the value for a particular key, again, analogous to an index on a vector, um, I can then modify that value using uh, once I've called dot at, assuming the key exists. Um, unlike square brackets, if I use dot at and I provide a key that doesn't exist, just like on a vector, that's like sort of the analog of an invalid index. Just like on a vector, if I do that, uh, I get an exception. Now, unlike the vector, the dot at function doesn't give us a very clever looking message, but it does, I guess, meet its bare minimum obligation. Um, so dot at is a good function to use if you believe that you are modifying an existing value because that way if you're wrong you get an exception so you can you can that, that would, which will, will help you correct your incorrect assumptions um, but either is correct if you know that you're changing a valid key then square brackets work as well again the next video points out a certain pitfall associated with um, using square brackets too much if you use square brackets and you're not too careful about it something weird can happen uh, but in general square brackets are fine unlike a vector where you really should be using dot at in all cases um, okay, so finally for this video, uh, I, I want to talk about, I guess actually I have one more thing after this, but I want to talk about how do we iterate over a map and then also um, how are the various ways besides the square brackets of adding keys and values to our maps. So formally a map is a collection of pairs, so key value pairs. And that means when I iterate over a map, I think reasonably, I shouldn't just be iterating over the keys or the values, I should be getting both. Um, and so when I iterate over a map, what I actually get back, if I use a for each loop, um, so I'll iterate over student names, when I use a for each loop over a map, what I'm actually getting at each step is a pair object, an object of type std pair. So p has type, um, in this case, the student names map is mapping a string to a string. So in this case, I'll have, it'll be pair of string and string. Uh, and in fact, if I didn't want to write auto, which I do, if I didn't want to write auto, I could use this as the type of P up on line 70. So if I want to print out each student's name and then um, their, or each student's student number and then their name, okay, so the pair that I get, the first element of the pair, P dot first, that's going to be the key. So that's going to be the student ID. And the second element of the pair, P dot second, is going to be the student's name. Uh, so I could try something like this. Uh, and so I just go through my map and it yields at each step one of these pair objects. I can then go in and I can query the dot first and dot second to get a particular part of it. Um, I'm going to try that for exam grades as well. Okay, so we'll make sure that that runs. And I hope staring at this, you think this is a bit clunky looking. This idea of this object P, which is a bit opaque, dots first, dots second, makes it a little bit hard for you to read it and figure out what you actually mean, um, which means you need more comments or something to make that happen. But it does work. So I'm iterating over the student names uh, map, and we can see I get each of the student IDs, um, and then I get each of the names of the students. So I get dot first and dot second. Um, like a set, a map does have a natural order that's based on ascending order of the elements. The ascending order, though, is based entirely on the keys. So as usual, as I've said previously in this video, the values just ride along. The map doesn't use them for internal organization. So that means that uh, when I iterate over a regular STD map, I should expect to visit each key in ascending order of the underlying type. In this case, it's the ascending order of the strings that are used as keys. Um, and uh, that's true of STD map, but not of STD unordered map, where the order is apparently arbitrary, as we've seen with STD unordered set. Uh, and then there are exam grades. Notice that, of course, the grades don't come back in order either, because the, the ordering is defined based on keys. OK, so back to the for each loop situation. Um, this notation is opaque. It makes it a lot harder for me to read and understand what's really going on here. But what I get back from the map at each step is an STD pair object. And I might recall from a previous video that I have the option of unpacking my pair objects. Um, so I'm going to do that. Um, I know that the first element of the pair is the student ID and the second element is the name. I can use that unpacking notation, which is formally called structured binding, as a way of uh, breaking the pair up 
before I get inside of my loop. And then I just create individual variables at each iteration called ID and name. And I can work directly with those. And I think that's amazing. I think that is a, um, a, a fantastic addition because it means when I'm writing my for each loop, anybody reading it doesn't need extra comments to get some general idea of what I'm trying to accomplish because I can use descriptive names for the variables. And we can see that that works. Um, for exam grades, I'll just leave this to sort of provide some contrast between, between the two uh, methods that are available. Um, so, but, but I guess in summary, I really encourage this notation. This I think is way better. Um, okay, so down here, finally, task four. Now I want to print out a single list of just ID, name, and grade all in one line. In a sense, I want to combine the information from these two maps together. I'm not trying to make up a third map here. I just want to print uh, the data out with the student ID, then their name, then their grade, all in one line. Um, the name of this operation uh, with respect to operations on data, so something you might see in a databases context, this is called a join operation. I have two maps, each that use the same common keys, so student ID, IDs, and I want to mix them together. So I want to print out student ID, name, and then grade. Um, there's a lot of reasons to stare at this and think this is actually going to be a pretty ugly problem because we recall from a previous case where we had two list objects and to combine them together to match them up, we had to use iterators. Although you can use iterators on maps, you don't have to do that here. The fast searching that maps provide uh, allows you to instead loop over one map and use that to drive the whole list. So here, I'm going to loop over my student names map again. And again, I'm going to call my elements ID and name. I'm going to split them up into key and value at each step. And then to print out the associated grade, all I have to do is I print out the ID and name, and then I go grab the grade associated with that ID. So I could do exam grades dot at ID. I could also use square brackets. Using dot at is helpful because if it turns out that there is a student who doesn't have a grade, it'll throw an exception. So I can then go back and rewrite the code accordingly based on if I was making the assumption incorrectly that everybody would have an exam grade. So I loop over student names, and then I just plug in the ID that I get into the dot at function to go search for the associated exam grade. So we'll try that. And there we go. So uh, we can just skim over that to verify that it is indeed printing the correct association of student ID. So there it is. Name, that also looks good. And the associated exam grade, that's also good as well. So uh, I'm, I'm able to join these maps together by looping over one of them and then doing a bunch of lookup operations into the other. Uh, and again, I think this is actually a very natural syntax because it is congruent to what we use to look up things at a particular position in a vector. Okay, so the next video we'll talk a little bit more about this issue about what square brackets really do. But keep in mind, in the meantime, square brackets are great. You can use them on a map, but don't use them on vectors if you can avoid it. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about how I construct maps. So here I have a map that maps strings to unsigned ints. And the idea is I want to construct a bunch of ratings of different types of fruit. Uh, something. This is just an application out of my spare time. Um, so I'll try compiling that. It's not going to do very much at first. So I'm going to add a bunch of stuff to this map, and then I'm going to print out um, the contents. I'm just going to iterate over the map and print out the name and the rating for each fruit in the map. Uh, and I'm using that nice unpacking notation here as well. So how can I add pairs to the map? Um, remember that, again, formally, a map contains a bunch of pair objects. Really, that's the currency that it trades in, pair objects. So when I add stuff to the map, when I initialize it, we're used to the idea of when I initialize a collection, I can add stuff when I create it. When I add something to the map formally, I'm adding a key value pair. So what I should be adding in, in, in the initializer is a, a, a pair initializer. So raspberry and then obviously raspberries are 10 out of 10. So this, these curly brackets here are how I would initialize a value of type std pair of string and int or string and unsigned int. Um, and so I could do that. Uh, and that's not that bad. That notation I think is pretty clean. The curly bracket using the initializer to initialize the pair. Um, alternatively, if I want to add stuff, I could use square brackets. I guess we'll do that one. We'll do method three next. So fruit ratings um, at the key pair, we'll use the actual fruit called pair, that's a 9 out of 10. Uh, and I'm an expert in this, so I know that's 9 out of 10. Uh, and so we've already seen that I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to add my, my key to the map using the square bracket operator. So there's the key, there's the value that I want to associate. Um, the map also has a dot insert function. So fruit ratings dot insert. Uh, and the insert function is similar to that for a set, which is I don't need to provide an iterator. But remember, what I am inserting is a pair object. So I, I don't provide two arguments to insert. I provide one argument that is a pair object. So one way of constructing a pair, besides using the curly brackets directly, is to call make pair. So I'll do lemon 
and that's a six. It's not everybody's favorite, but I think it's a solid six. Um, so I use make pair to create a pair of string and unsigned int. And then I insert that into my map. So that's one way of using dot insert. Alternatively, I could just provide, because dot insert is expecting a pair of string and unsigned int, I could just provide the initializer for that pair object, just like I was doing on line 16. Uh, and then obviously that's a zero. Uh, okay, so I do that, and then that constructs the pair object, and then it inserts it into the map. So we'll just try that out. So there are a variety of options. Um, and as I said, it is quite natural to use square brackets to insert things, but you'll often find yourselves wanting to insert a bunch of keys and values at the beginning when the map is initialized, and there are reasons that dot insert can be helpful. So one of them is, like a set, dot insert has a return value that helps you understand whether you added something new to the map or uh, or not, uh, like whether you updated some existing key. Um, and so that's something you don't get out of square brackets, and as I mentioned in the video about sets, there are reasons that that can be helpful. There are also other techniques you can use to decide if the key already exists, um, and the next video we'll talk about those.